It's a big pleasure for me to be here and it was also for us a great joy to see us again because we haven't seen each other for too many years to count. <laughs> so it's great to have you here. And for preparation of the talk I also watched some of the old videos and it was all these memories were coming back and with you here and Frenchy. So but I think that a lot of people don't know who you are. So maybe, besides the saw the name Aaron Stevens and Tammy Stevens, so what did you connect to Frankie Manning? Why did you come actually here to Boogie Bear and Dance Camp? Do I have to start my whole story just like that? <laughs> <laughs> no, start at the beginning. Do you want me to start at the beginning? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, well we're a sister act, first of all. Uh, and best friends since childhood, and I, I don't know, I got bit by the dance bug in college. And in my early years of college, I, I give her the credit because she was a Marx Brothers fan, and she brought home a day at the races on VHS. So I marked the day that VHS came out as being when my life was changed <laughs> to see this video. But we had been swing dancing our whole lives. We saw our parents swing dance at a family reunion um, when we were very little. And literally we said, we want to do that because <laughs> our father was a fabulous dancer. Uh, our mother was a ballerina, but our dad was a swing dancer and together they were beautiful. So. I had this uh, desire to swing dance. There was a time in Los Angeles that swing was very, very popular. You could, when I say swing, I mean swing music. You could go to the Hollywood Bowl and see all the big names. You could see Count Basie, Ella Fitzgerald. Uh, everybody was coming through, but also Disneyland. You could go on the stage at Carnation Plaza. You could sit this close to the bands. Uh, you know, we have pictures of ourselves standing with Lionel Hampton, yeah, and, and Count Basie because they were all playing here. We didn't realize growing up with this, you know, how extraordinary it was. We just, this, is, this was normal to us to have these bands around. And we wanted to dance to the bands. Well, we were swing dancing the way we knew to swing, just a very basic step. And you could win a lot of uh, contests at this time with the big bands. They would often do a dance contest. And they were doing a contest uh, for cha-cha. <laughs> but we were good at cha-cha, so we were winning all the contests. And one night, the band surprised us and said, uh, tonight it's a swing contest. We're like, okay, well we weren't great swing dancers, but we, we loved it. But anyway, my partner at that time, we just goofed off. He jumped over my head, he did the splits. We just <laughs> responded to the music and we won. And we said, maybe we ought to learn to swing a bit more. <laughs> and I'll just say that you actually made a lot of money in those competitions. <laughs> we were both going to school separately at different colleges, but both studying dance. She actually majored in dance choreography and teaching. Not swing choreography. No. no. But early in 1983, we decided to start some classes of our own. And at that time, she was dancing and bringing in a lot of money. But when she graduated, she came home and we thought, yes, let's start those classes we talked about. So she brought home this movie, A Day at the Races. <laughs> about the same time, our dad brought home a magazine, just by chance. It was the Life magazine from August 23rd, 1943. I'm probably wrong. Don't quote me on that. It's correct. It's correct? It's correct. <laughs> anyway, it has, <laughs> it has the words Lindy Hop, and that was the first time we could put a name to what the dancers in A Day at the Races were doing because some of the same dancers were in the magazine. So that was like this puzzle piece going, well, we have to find these dancers. So I went to New York in search of the roots of swing as a young girl just feeling like 
it was a calling, I had to go. I had to go. So I stood in a phone booth in Greenwich Village with a bunch of dimes, 10 cents, to put in a phone booth and go through the dancers in the magazine that were in a day at the races were Leon James and Willa Mae Richter. And I was calling every Leon James in the book. <laughs> it's a very popular name in New York. <laughs> Pages of Leon James. And after a while I thought, there has to be a better way to do this. <laughs> So I, there was a big ad, I turned to dance studios, and there was a big ad for Sandra Cameron Dance Studios. And I called them, and just by chance, Sandra's husband, Paul, answered the phone. And all I said was, do you know any old Lindy Hoppers? And he said, I do. <laughs> and he gave me the home phone number for Al Mims. And Al was also one of the dancers at the same time as Leon James. I found out that Leon had passed away some 10 years prior. So uh, I met with Al. And Al was a phenomenal <coughs> dancer. But he had been hit, uh, mugged in New York. And he only had peripheral vision. He looked fine, but he couldn't see you here. He could only see you here. So he would talk to you this way. <laughs> hey, Tammy, how you doing tonight? <laughs> but I said, well, we want to learn to Lindy hop, and you know, we want to look like a day at the races. And he said, well, let's see what you do. And we went side, side, rock step. He said, that's great. That's good enough. Do that. <laughs> but let me teach you some tricks. <laughs> I was like, OK. That was fun, but I still thought there's something missing here. You know, this just, I knew there was more to the dance than I had, but Al was fabulous. He, he took, as a person, he took us on a tour of Harlem. We saw all the clubs that he had danced in. He took us to Small's Paradise, and we danced to, wait, I'm gonna get it. The, oh wow, what's the name of the band? Harlem Blues and Jazz Band which later we brought them out to California. It was made up of a bunch of little old guys. Oh, Can you just describe Well, they had all played with the original big bands. I mean, all of the great big bands. Benny Goodman, Cal Basie, and they were, there was Eddie Durham who wrote Jumpin' at the Woodside. They were just, he looked like he was falling asleep when he wasn't playing. And then his moment would come and he'd pick up that horn and he'd just start playing like crazy. And they were absolutely phenomenal. And they were all together because at that moment, yes, you know, the, the time of the 50s and 60s when they really had no place to play had passed. So suddenly they had reorganized all of them together under that name, the Harlem Blues and Jazz Band, but they were all just famous, famous musicians. No sheet music, no, no. no stands in front of them, just little men feeling and hearing the music. It was so fabulous. But anyway, I'm way off track from your question. Oh, <laughs> you you, you, you got it. Oh, yeah, you got right. it. Okay. You know, so, it reminds me, we, you know Roy Dameron, the dancer from the day. Yes. We did an interview with him. So he set up the camera and said, hey, Roy, get started. Maybe just say your name. You talk for 45 minutes. <laughs> you don't have anywhere to go tonight, do you? <laughs> Classes don't start tomorrow until when? We have time. Okay, so we had a great time with Al, but I knew that there was more, and I wanted, I still wanted more from the basic. So there was a lot more research that was going on. We were going through other life magazines. We found the name Frankie Manning, throwing his partner in the air. This time, instead of just going to New York, we went to the Pasadena Public Library and looked through their phone books. And there were only three Frankie Mannings listed. So I took the numbers home, I called the first one, and I said, hello, is this Frankie Manning, the swing dancer? And he said, do you guys all know this story already? <laughs> he said, nope. I'm Frankie Manning, the postal worker. <laughs> and then there was a pause that followed it with the best line of all. But I used to be Frankie Manning, the Lindy Hopper. <laughs> I said, 
if I come to New York, will you teach me? And he said, nope. <laughs> but if you come to New York, I'll meet you. <laughs> so back on the airplane, back to New York. And now times had changed because we met Al Mins in 1984. And now it's 1986. So two years later, uh, the New York Sweet Dance Society had formed. I've made contacts with people in New York. I'm reaching out to everywhere trying to put this puzzle back together of this dance that is basically unheard of at this point in time. I mean, we're from California, and West Coast Swing was all the rage, and East Coast Swing, the single rhythm. But Lindy Hop was just gone at this time. So we were on this quest to bring it back. So in 86, I arrived back in New York, and there was a, a band leader that I had met, a, a young guy, who was putting on a dance in a bank vault, the, the basement of an abandoned bank. But people came. There were people from everywhere. I don't know, I always say this, but it's like close encounters of the third kind. I say that. It was like, why are you here? I have come to New York in search of the roots of swing. <laughs> Why are you here? I have come to New York in search of the roots of swing. It just happened. It was a time when it, it was the right time. That's all I can say. And, and there we were. Jonathan and Sylvia from Santa Barbara were also there. There was a man called Jitterbug Joe from Colorado. I don't even know what became of him. I've lost track of him. There were other people there that, that became close friends that we realized we were all on this hunt. And so we're all having this great time just swing dancing in this basement of an abandoned bank. And all of a sudden, in walks Frankie and Norma, and they sit by the door. They just sit as close to the door as they could sit, just looking. And so we're dancing and we're dancing. I'm like, that's Frankie. <laughs> so I go over, and he's just been watching us. And I go, hi, Frankie. And I introduce myself, and I said, I really want you to work with me. Will you work with me? And he said yes. <laughs> so this was not a man that was a teacher. This was Frankie Manning, the swing dancer who danced from his heart. He didn't know how to count to dance. He didn't know how to teach me. But he had it in his heart and soul. And he told us the next day uh, to meet him at his apartment in Queens. We went to the apartment, we met his son Chaz, and at this point, I had been dancing to the song Sing Sing Sing. That was kind of my song. Every band played it. We were now getting ready in case they said, it's a contest. Okay, we've got our Sing 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 ready. Yes, we'll do all our albums, aerials, this and that, and, and we'll do our basic this way. <laughs> and so we got to his apartment, he rolled the rug back. He showed us all of his photo albums, I mean, I didn't really realize what a spectacular treat I was in for as we walked in the door. But he put the carpet back and said, okay, let's see what you can do. And we popped in our cassette, sing, sing, sing. <laughs> and he pushed stop, <laughs> took it out. He put in his own CD, boom. Boom, boom, shiny stockings. He picked me up in his arms. He led me through a Lindy Hop. I had never danced it before. He didn't explain it to me. I felt it. My world was changed. I always say, Al Hens taught me tricks and aerials, an understanding of the beginning of the Lindy Hop, but Frankie gave me the heart and soul of the dance, and I understood it from that moment on. Thank you for this great story. <laughs> I have tears in my eyes. Tell about another memory I had, Miss Berlin, because once Frankie, after BBBC, um, he was staying close to me, and we, he came to my house, and we had a private with Frankie. And of course, we put the jumping at the woodside, Busted out like hell. Thought, hmm, cool. 
Frankie shook his head, <laughs> changed the music to a slow song, and says, okay, get in close position, do your eight count basic, and just go over the floor. And we couldn't do it. <laughs> but, but see, by then, he, could, he understood eight count basic. Yeah. <laughs> For me, he couldn't even say that. Oh. When we first had him come to California, he just taught with, uh, 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 you know, and I had to translate. <laughs> ah, I get it now, you know, by watching his feet, because we were accustomed to teaching by that point. But uh, there's a whole lot to learn from an uh, 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 uh. <laughs> And I, I'll say this is not to, not to conclude, there's much more to say, but I had this phenomenal moment with Frankie many years later. So you go from 1986 to 2000. Four, I guess, and we've had our swing camp at Catalina Island, and we're people came from all over the world, just like here, to be at this amazingly beautiful swing camp that we put on for ten years. We don't do it anymore, but I had this moment with Frankie when we were staring out over this packed stage, full of people from all over the world, and I just said, Frankie, did you ever think when we met? that we would be standing here together, looking at this. I mean, a sea of people, Lindy hopping. I just said, no, babe, not in my wildest dreams. <laughs> and I, I felt that too. It was just such an amazing, I don't know, dream come true. That's all I can say. Yeah, Catalina has this wonderful ground ballroom. Built out into the ocean, so it's surrounded three quarters of the way by crashing waves, and it's, it's absolutely exquisite. And can you imagine you have a class that Frankie and Aaron taught with 600 people in the class? <laughs> no, it was packed. It was a, it was a time. There was no Very YouTube popular. yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe I would like to ask one question to the audience, because we talked a lot about Frankie, and how <laughs> some of the older generation who has been here before maybe had a chance to meet Frankie. So my one question is, how many of you have met Frankie in person? Wow, so few. So few, yeah. Then the other question, how many of you before today have never heard about Frankie Manning? Yeah, yeah be great, be great, that's okay. So we're on a quest. That's good. That's that was good, good. Yeah. that was good. And in Pasadena, when we first began bringing Frankie out, no one knew the word Lindy Hop. So we would have to write on our flyers just to get students to come. We would write East Coast Swing slash Jitterbug slash Lindy Hop. And people would come in and go, what is this, Lindy Hop? And even when Frankie began coming out to Pasadena and he was doing workshops just in Lindy Hop, a lot of people walked in the door thinking, what is Lindy Hop? But now, the whole world over knows the word again, thanks to Frankie. And before Frankie passed, he had put his feet on every continent and taught the dance. And that was really his dream once he started teaching again. And yeah, and, and just to say, Frankie Manning, he, we call him the ambassador of Lindy Hop, but he was, he was a kind soul in a world that is sometimes divided between dance styles, it's like the sharks and the jets from, you know, it, it can get it can get from West Side Story. Yeah, it can get it can get rough out there. And Frankie was the the mediator that was just like, can we just dance? Can we all just get along? Can we just dance? And he went through a rough time. You know, he went through a very segregated of. Uh, life and uh, hit some very hard times and never let it affect him when he was traveling and they wouldn't let him eat at a restaurant because they were black. Never let it affect him. He said, we just laughed about it. It was like, come on, we, we know better. But, you know, just, he always looked on the bright side. That's, that's all I can say. And that was so infectious to those of us that were learning to dance under Frankie. It was just joy set to music. It really was. That's what that's what we were taught. I mean, it's like this is you express your joy to the dance. And you were talking that you brought Frankie out to Pasadena and thanks to VHS and uh, now YouTube, we have one clip to show. I think it was from 1989.
Frankie first came in 1988 to teach for us, and I can remember sitting on the uh, front porch of my parents' house when he said yes, and I, I just, I can remember sitting there and thinking, this is it. This is the greatest moment of my life. <laughs> if I die tomorrow, you know, I've got Frankie coming to Pasadena. <laughs> And just being so overwhelmed that this was going to happen. And, and you couldn't really see the line of dancers behind. Scott is one of them. Tammy was in there too. But yeah, Scott is, by the way, Tammy's husband and very much a part of us. We're the trio here this weekend. But uh, by that time, he came in 1988. And from our meeting him in 1986 to 1988, uh, starting these classes and using the word Lindy Hop, now we have this whole line of dancers that was doing this Lindy routine, and then Frankie and I jumped out at that moment and did Frankie's little solo. But uh, it, it, it changed. I mean, we were we were working the dance. It was coming. It was back. It was it was like putting um, a puzzle together when there there was no map. You know, we really you just had to start somewhere and build. And I think it's it's so phenomenal now the resources we have to learn this dance, and it just wasn't there at that time except Frankie that was the key. And at Catalina, since they mentioned Catalina, in 1994, when we started, we had about 100 students. And in 1999, we had 2,400 that came to the casino ballroom from around the globe. So in those years, when we decided that 1999 was kind of the peak year for swing, everybody was saying we're Lindy Hop at that moment in time. That was the year of the Gap commercial. Yes, Gap. the Gap commercial. In, in yeah. case you haven't seen it, there was a commercial from Gap, the clothes uh, company, and they were dancing to a jump jive and whale with the khaki jeans. And the advertising was just people, young people dancing, and it was shortly after Matrix came out, so they used this jump in the air freeze frame where the camera moves around. So this was really, really new effect. And then it just said khaki swings. And the interesting part, I read about it, that normally all these advertisements were made to a special group of age, like youngsters or middle age or certain group. And this was the first clip they ever had that reached from young to old the complete population. And I got an award, I think, for this one. It was unexpected. And I didn't expect it to get this hit. And then everybody at this time, I think it was MySpace or something, was talking about what is this gap dance? And then people got up and said, oh no, this is the Lindy Hop and everything, and people got the crown up. But the kids wanted to do yes. the gap dance. <laughs> and then suddenly, I remember we've been in LA at this time. You could be somewhere in the street in Pasadena, LA, and says, I can teach Lindy Hop. Boom! And everyone was there. Nightclubs before the dance, it was packed with people. Every society event had Lindy Hop at this time. What I wanted to mention is because 89 was also the year that Frankie was the first time in Harang, in Sweden, for the Harang dance camp. And so Frankie uh, was teaching because the Swedes were the same as you, one of the people who were on the quest to find the original dancers. And they also did the thing actually, they had two weeks, traveled to New York, went through the phone books, <laughs> and tried to find the people, first. met El Mins first, brought El Mins out to uh, Sweden, I think it was 84 when it was the first time, and I think it was 86 something when El Mins passed away. And then they came to New York and they were at a dance, and they met Norma, and Norma said, You don't know Frankie Manning, the greatest dancer of all times? <laughs> <laughs> and so this is how they got to know Frankie, invited him to go to Harang, and then in 89, Frankie was the first time with his son Jazz teaching in Harang. And it was interesting because in 89 there was a boogie woogie competition in Freising. It was a European boogie woogie competition. And I danced, not with Bert, because I was my former dance partner there. And after this one, the, um, there were dancers actually from Sweden. And they just learned the Lindy Hop from Frankie in the summertime. And then in autumn they came and danced this Lindy Hop style at this competition. We looked at them and said, this looks like an Elsa Poppin and they the races and well. So we got to talk to them and we went to the Oktoberfest the next day. And so we're sitting there drinking some beer and then one of the guys asked me, hey, do you know this movie um, called Elsa Poppin? I didn't understand it because we had German titles. In the Hölle ist der Teufel los. So in the, in the hell the devil gets loose. <laughs> 
And so he asked me, do you remember the scene where this guy throws the lady around and pulls her back and said, yeah, this is my favorite dance scene. Yeah, he just taught in Sweden. <laughs> it was the shock of my life. And then one of the dancers, Marie, she could speak German. So they actually sent us a translation of the playbill of the program from the Harang dance camp. Because at this time, everything was in Swedish. There were like 150 dancers there. And everything was in Swedish. So they sent us this thing. Unfortunately, from 1990, we already had planned for the holidays. So we couldn't make it anymore, but then we planned for 91. So we were eight people from Munich, and we drove up with the car 30 hours to Sweden. And then we got a little bit puzzled. The problem was, they told us it's 10 miles north of Stockholm. But a Swedish mile is, is 16, uh, 10, 10 times a mile. So like kilometers. So instead of having it like 16 kilometers, it was 100 kilometers. So we're going in the woods and in the woods and in the woods. And this can't be right. This can't be right. And got dark and woods. And suddenly there was huh? Yes. Yeah. No GPS. We were still with the big map folding it. And Bella was in the group. Uh, Dunia was not Dunia. Sorry. Um, Tom. Tom was in the group. He was there, and some other people from Munich. And then at 2 a.m. in the morning, we arrived, there was a sign, happening. Super small village, you know, there's nothing. At this time, there was one little kiosk in the supermarket and one telephone booth. That was all that you could find there. And then at 2 a.m., we went up there and, you know, discovered Lindy Hop, and I had my first dance with W at 2 a.m. in the morning, doing only six counts. <laughs> and the next day, Second, yeah, and the next day then we met Frankie and you, but... Yeah. No, okay. no. I just wanted to add that when Lennart was here for a talk, yeah. he said that the Munich people introduced the parties at Harang, because Harang people would only do classes, but the Munich people brought their cassette recorders in the evening, put it on and danced, and that was the beginning of the parties at Harang. <laughs> yes. And there was a second thing that was interesting because Eddie talked about it. Because at this time, when you went to Harang, you had three different classes. First, it was the routine class. So you learned, it was a whole week long, so six days, and you learned one complete routine from the beginning to the end. No technique or something, just running through the routine, and at the end of the week, you performed it. Then you had a jazz class, so you learned a jazz routine. In the advanced class, we learned two routines in the week. <laughs> two jazz and two linear routines. And then there was the social class, which was nothing about lead and follow. It was just different variations we could do in the swing out and footwork. That was all. And this was the whole week. And so when we came, and we suddenly did not dance any routines. And Eddie said, this is weird, I don't dance routines. And this also started to make a change in Harang, and then they asked us to teach Boogie Woogie there, and because the specialty was that we didn't dance routines. But there we met Frankie, we met you, this was the first connection, and then a year later in 92, uh, Babel and me, for the first time, went to the United States, first a week in New York, staying with Frankie, and also going to the nightclubs there, and meeting everyone, and then we went for a week to LA, first with Rob van Haren, and with Rob, he drove us to um, Ventura, met Irene Thomas. And then a few days later, we drove to El, uh, Las Vegas to meet Norma. She just finished her show. She had a comedy show in Vegas. Like at 3 a.m. in the morning, we met her for a buffet. And this is how we got to know Norma. And then we came to you, stayed with you. And this is how everything kind of started. And then in 92, actually, also, we invited then Frankie to come to the Boogie Band Dance Camp. And this also when you came the first time here. So what was your memory? What was, your ex what was it for you, especially being okay. in a different country? Okay. What year was it that I came 92. here? 92. I do have one memory of this camp. I do. It's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I remember coming in jet lagged, you know, coming into the, the big room next door and sitting and just seeing a sea of people dancing and they were playing Caledonia. And I sat down and I was like, da 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 Ooh, the entire floor. And it was the first time that I'd seen that many people in one place 
danced to the music so beautifully. <laughs> and I was really impressed. <laughs> oh, they listen to the music here. That's my memory. <laughs> it was great. And then we brought Marcus out to specifically teach classes in musicality for swing dancing. Ah, yes, that is true. <laughs> Uh, well, I was going to just, just backtrack a little bit to say when I was saying Close Encounter of the Third Kind and that we were in New York, that at that same time, Ryan Francois was also in that room, and that led to us being invited to go to England to teach, and while we were in England, just by chance, Leonard and Katrine were there. And I mean, again, it was just this weird thing that we, we met up with them, dancing, and then we ended up flying to Sweden to see what they did, and it just started this whole, like, putting the puzzle together. Everything, the way it fell into place was so wild. And then, as you're saying, you know, all of a sudden we're teaching a harangue, and, which, when I got invited, I didn't do that here because I'd already danced some by then, but when I, harangue was the first dance camp that I got invited to teach at with Frankie. And I literally jumped off every couch pillow around my house. <laughs> Just I was so excited with the idea that there were dance camps forming, and you know that I was going to be traveling with Frankie. And it, it that was the beginning of a of a wonderful uh, travel period of my life with Frankie. But it also led to these amazing friendships and meeting people all over the world, including Marcus and Bella. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, it was 92 when Frankie was here the first time, and I remember very clearly because when Frankie came, yeah, he did not have like a full schedule. He had like taster classes because at this time we had the regular classes and the taster class. So on the first day, it was before we had any party going on, there was this taster class. And it was a big three room uh, gymnasium, like a really big floor. And if you remember, because you and Frankie were there alone. Nobody came for the first class. <laughs> Have I say I don't remember that? <laughs> but I believe you. Because then in the night when the party ha after the party happened the next day, all this three hall gymnasium was packed. I think everyone from the camp was in this class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's. Yeah, if you have to know what Libby is, to want to come. But I still remember down in the basement at the dressing rooms when you tried to show me still how the swing out is properly done because I didn't do it well. <laughs> 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 it's good times. And actually we have, not from 92, but from 93, we have a nice clip of you dancing with Frankie at the big party. Bring it on. Yeah. Let's see what it is.
second special guest, which was Gil Brady. He's the one with the big eyeglasses from Don't Knock the Rock, who goes in a circle fast. And Frankie and Gil were my two big idols when I started dancing. I watched these clips over and over. And I remember when I was young and started dancing, I watched, watched these clips and said, oh, this would be my dream to meet these people once and learn from them. And in 93, I had Frankie in one arm, Gil in the other arm, and my dream came true. And the difference here, you know, you were used to dance with Frankie, but Gil kind of came alone. He had nobody he was used to dance with. So the DJ put a song on, because everyone asked him, okay, hey, after Frankie, you know, Gil, you have to come out. And so Gil just grabbed a few of the first he started dancing with you, and then you danced with some other people. And so we can watch this, and then something really funny happened, because originally the DJ actually wanted to play Rip It Up, but he had the wrong cue. So he played a slow song, and which was great, because Gil liked it better this way, but then Gil had to dance a little bit on the fast song, on Rip It Up, but he didn't have a partner, and it didn't really work so well, and see what's coming next.
But she wouldn't know it here. This is before his hip replacement. Because he was like, he looked at Gil dancing with that skate, and he was just like, I can do that. <laughs> 20 years older than Gil. Determination, and it was that moment when he just grabbed me after Gil had been dancing, and it was just like, okay, you know, wait, well, I can do that. But it was also at this camp that I was waiting for Frankie in the lobby of the hotel, and all of a sudden, it was the way the mezzanine was. You could just see the legs coming down the stairs, and here came this person, just. And I was going, wow, they didn't have an elevator in the hotel. And I was like, wow, this person's really having trouble. And then I, it's Frankie. And we catch, catch eyes, and he goes, hey, babe. <laughs> <laughs> I was just I was walking out like, Frankie, you're hurting. That's what he did, bad hip and all. It was like, he just, when he was dancing, it was joy. He, he wanted to dance. Lots of I can recall some of those memories. <laughs> Oh yeah, and remember after afterwards I asked Frankie, Frankie, was there a little competition? Oh definitely. <laughs> and he said, Yeah, you know, we always have competitions in the old days. <laughs> yeah, but nice. So before we wanna wrap up a few things at the end, maybe are there any questions in the audience? Habt ihr Fragen, die ihr gerne Erin oder Tammy stellen wollt? Gerne auch auf Deutsch, wir können es dann übersetzen. Did Frankie also dance other dance style than the other dancers? Yeah. yeah, yeah, he could do everything. <laughs> he could, and it's funny because, uh, yeah, I think he he just he grew with with time. I mean, he started with Lindy Hop, but whatever was popular at the time. So yeah, he could cha cha, <laughs> and in fact, he does a step in his Lindy Hop called the cha cha move, and he does a step in his Lindy called the tango move. Because, yeah, he stole from the dances. Yeah. And I should just say that we were one of the last people that got to interview him before he passed. Because we had been um, hired to write a book about swing dancing. But we went to New York and sat in his apartment and talked to him. And we wanted to just get straight some of the names of the moves. Because, you know, just there is no universal word for all of these various patterns and steps. So he, we actually were able to write down on paper exactly the way he called some of the old moves. And we will dance some of those, I guess, tomorrow night. Yeah. <laughs> well, to, tomorrow night, because they, they asked us to reform. I thought, I hope it turns out OK, because I did it on a voice memo. But I thought it would be fun to put the names of the moves with the steps. So I voice memoed over the song, calling all Frankie moves. So hopefully it'll work tomorrow. <laughs> I just wanted to make a joke and ask you if you dance with subtitles, but then it's much better. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love, I mean, Frankie was such a character, and there was such, such joy in the dance moves, but I would say you, you had to leave who you thought you were at the door before you learned to Lindy Hop, and just be ready for anything when you come in. Because it is just character to music. It's, there's actually a short story I heard from you a few times when you met Frankie the first time and you asked him to show you the swing out. Do you remember this one? No. No? <laughs> this is the one I remember most because if I'm not mistaken, you ask Frankie, hey, can you show me the swing out? So he danced, swing out was the kick step and the one and the da da da, -da and the kick away and you ask him which one was the swing out? <laughs> and he said, all three of them. <laughs> Am I mistaken? Uh, that's a great story. I don't know. <laughs> that's a story. I don't know. It sounds right. I tell it all the time to our students. <laughs> I like it. And it sounds like totally right. 
totally Frankie. I mean, that, that is the way it would have been, so I'm 100% believing you. Okay, good. This is what I remember, at least. <laughs> No, it's true. It was very hard to, to pinpoint, you know, a definition, because Frankie wasn't that way. It was just, let's dance. You know, that was the bottom line. Let's dance. <laughs> well, you know, kind of had to think about it all. Well, later on, he did evolve into a far better teacher. I mean, that is, you know, he was always a great teacher. It was just, he evolved better into a teacher the way we needed it, I guess, the structured teaching for students. And uh, yeah, and in the end, he was fabulous at it. I have to say something about that. What was it? Oh, was it my wedding? Yeah. OK, so I had a dream wedding because I did a great wedding escape to Hawaii, danced the first dance with my husband, and danced the second dance to Shiny Stockings with Frankie. So that's, that was a dream. And, I mean, my dad, too, was there. I think I danced the third dance with my dad. <laughs> yeah. but, but just to have Frankie you know, he was that much a part of our lives. I mean, he, he called us his California family, and we really felt that way. And when Tammy was talking about that last trip to New York, Frankie had broken his hip, the hip that he had had replaced. And uh, I, I don't know how much you guys know about his, his story, but he came home on an airplane from France, I think it was, with a broken hip. Sat, just wanted to get home, and he, he slipped in the shower or something, and so flew home. Went through the surgery and really, you know, everyone just thought this was the end. And we, we felt like we had to go see him one more time. He was sitting in a chair in his apartment, at the same apartment I'd been to before. And he was just sitting there. It was very empty and he had the, the cane beside him, but, you know, just in the chair. Didn't get up. We walked over to him, gave him hugs, chatted, and we were saying, wow, you know, George G is playing at um, Club 46, Club 46. And he's just sitting there and he goes, let's go. And he just shocks us, gets up out of his chair, walks on that cane. I mean, he could barely walk, but he wanted to go out. So we went out one more time with Frankie. We didn't dance with him at that time. It was very close to the end. But I mean, he was just a trooper till the end because he, he loved swing music. He loved to see the dance. Yeah, Frankie talked often about the fact that when they did performances, and in his youth day, when Mr. was the Lindy Hoppers, that normally after they did their jobs, he took everyone to go dancing. So that the job is the one thing, but the dancing stays still, the fun and the joy, and yeah. So I think we have two more things we could address, if there are no other questions. Um, yes. So do you know if you enjoy dancing to boogie movie music? <laughs> 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 I think he enjoyed dancing to anything. Okay. Yeah, Frankie, and I mean, and he would have liked the challenge of the different tempos. And, yeah. Oh yeah, no. The the one point actually to answer your question more precisely is first to ask what do you understand when you talk about boogie woogie music? Yeah. Because nowadays when the boogie woogie dancers talk about boogie woogie music, we often mean actually rhythm and blues or fifties music, but classical boogie woogie was before swing music. Okay. And uh, there's this one CD, Frankie's favorite where Frankie chose a collection of, I think, 20 songs or 15 songs or something, and one of them is Ham's Boogie Woogie. Yeah, played by the big band, which was then the popular uh, orchestras to play the music. Um, but this is also a very interesting fact. Um, if you think about when swing music became mainstream, it was the big concert in Carnegie Hall. And it was in January 1938 when Benny Goodman played and was the big thing and suddenly it was mainstream. The same year in December was the other concert from Spirituals to Boogie Woogie, or from Spirituals to Swing, when Boogie Woogie music became mainstream. It was in the same year that Swing and Boogie Woogie music became mainstream in the US. So, yeah. yo, also. He also always warm us up to that. That's Scott. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Frankie would always warm us up to line uh, dances. To line dance, yeah, to uh, the electric slide. Yep. Yeah, it's mainly. You know, just, just wanted to keep everything, yeah, <laughs> young, I guess, you know, just try to keep up with that. That's true. Always, Frankie was always up to the times, and what's, what, when something new came up, he picked it up and used it, and yeah. And, and just to say, we, we've had our business together as the Stevens sisters for 41 years doing, pa we call ourselves Pasadena Ballroom Dance. We named ourselves that before we knew what we were doing. 
but <laughs> it's wind changer. And we couldn't change it because we were known by it. <laughs> but it's, we have live swing bands every Saturday night, and we teach Lindy Hop, and we have a huge following. We teach everything. Hoppers. We teach everything. It's social. Just social. It's all social dancing. Yeah, our ballroom is just American social. Yeah. No competition. So we want to actually go one year further to 94 because we also have some videos from, no, this is the other one, from the DVD. I told you it will be funny, I told you it will be funny. <laughs> this was down the hall here. He's wearing my picture on his sweatshirt. Yeah. <laughs> that was the from Pasadena Ballroom Association. <laughs> yeah, and now we jump a little bit forward. Because I had this crazy idea to create a dance award called Friendly Manning Award. And Frankie was, of course, the first one who got it. And he didn't expect this at all. see it just in a few few moments. And it was the year when we tried to do make a record for the Guinness Book too with the Shim Shim. And we just missed it. And that's Frankie and Aaron there. You were showing the steps. Yeah. And now it's his birthday dance. change your way of dancing and how did you feel yeah I said it, it was the heart and soul I mean it yeah. was a, it was it was it went from being the importance of a step to be the importance of the feeling and that's that's really what it's about that connection when you're dancing I mean Frankie would always say you're in love with this partner for the dance and then you walk away mm -hmm. but you have to you have to embrace that dance like let's do this together it's something you're creating and and Frankie taught me that that yeah it's the feeling in in the basic, it's not how many steps you know, it's just that joy of the basic step. 
and the feeling with a partner. Partner dancing is great. <laughs> if one day, far from now, you will meet Frankie in Lily Hop Heaven, what do you think you will say to you? <laughs> He will say, thanks babe, I owe a lot to you. Because when he won the Tony Award in 1989 for Black and Blue, the Broadway musical, we were all at our family residence and he called the house from New York, from New York and he was on speakerphone, and on our regular telephone, and said, I owe this all to you, babe. <laughs> As a family, we were very impressed. We were like, wow, that's amazing. We did feel like he was our family. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I would hope he would say. <laughs> but like, you know, when you do those Susie cues, you put your foot down. <laughs> Frankie was so positive and kind about everything, but he did not want you to leave your foot up in the air on the Susie Q. <laughs> he said it much nicer than Norma. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> what did you do up there? <laughs> Ja, wenn keine Fragen mehr sind. Thank you guys for sitting and listening. Thank you so much. And I guess some people are maybe not daring. Uh, asking questions, but oh, you're around, and yeah, I think yeah. everyone should grab yeah, the opportunity. Yeah. Okay, um, also, wenn ihr euch jetzt vielleicht nicht getraut habt zu fragen, äh, die beiden sind hier und äh, während des ganzen Camps könnt ihr sie noch ansprechen, fragen und das ein Schatz zu bergen. Ja? Äh, ich glaube, das haben wir nicht so oft diese Gelegenheit. Und falls euch zwischendrin was einfällt, schreibt es einfach auf, auch wenn es nach dem Wochenende ist, weil vielleicht in 20 Jahren sehen wir uns ja wieder. <lacht> After translate now. I said, if the maybe the question comes up in their mind, yeah. then they should write it down so they can ask you. And if it's after the weekend, and if it's after the weekend, then they still have it written down so they can ask it in 20 years. <lacht> 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 <lacht>